Good morning, everybody. It is uh, 7.30, so we're going to go ahead and get started to just keep everybody on schedule. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Ruth Bristol this morning. Um, had we not been in the OR late last night, I was thinking about putting together a PowerPoint of uh, photos from the time she was a resident up until now. So I've known uh, Dr. Bristol since she was a resident at BNI, and so it's a particular pleasure to introduce her this morning. She completed um, medical school at Tulane University in New Orleans and then went on to do her residency at BNI and then completed her fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery at uh, Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. And then we had the privilege of having uh, Ruth come back and join us here in Phoenix. And she's been a member of the Barrow Clefton Craniofacial Center since, it's, uh, since she arrived. And then we transitioned over to PCH here. She currently serves as the um, neurosurgical director of our craniofacial program at Barrow and at PCH and assistant program director for pediatric neurosurgery fellowship in the residency rotation. Um, she and I have done a fair amount of research together and she has a number of peer reviewed publications, book chapters, and we could go on and on, but I'm going to let Ruth start her talk. Uh, she's going to be talking about funny shaped heads. Welcome. Well, considering I've been to both Tokyo and Cancun with Devinder, I'm glad there was no slideshow this morning. <laughs> Uh, so, it's my pleasure to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, which is the management of babies with funny shaped heads. Uh, as I often tell families, particularly uh, who have a normal baby and need no surgery, there is nothing better than seeing healthy babies all day long in my clinic. Um, so I started giving a version of this talk uh, after just a couple years in practice when I um, realized that there's a large volume of patients seeking reassurance for their baby's head shape. And obviously being surgeons, as I know many of you in the audience are, um, we try to fill our clinics with things that need surgery as opposed to things that don't need surgery. So um, I kind of came about this with a two-pronged approach, one of which was to provide as much education as possible to give people the tools to make that decision themselves so they didn't feel the need to refer. Um, and then also starting an abnormal head shape clinic where it's really a high throughput clinic where I literally just look at the head. They don't get a full neurologic exam, but we try to get them in and out and provide that reassurance for the families who really want it. So we'll get started. Um, first, I'll say that I have no disclosures. Sorry, I didn't make a slide. Um, and then second of all, I want to thank Katie Class and Devinder and the Barrow Cleft and Craniofacial team because they, in many ways, have contributed to this whole presentation. So I often start with this slide just to kind of keep in the back of our minds this question about what is normal. And so obviously there have been cultures um, throughout time, uh, including some now, who feel that uh, a certain head shape is more preferable to others. Uh, and when it comes down to the brain itself, as long as the brain has room for growth, uh, that should really be fine. Uh, but we, when we're meeting patients and, and talking about what's normal, some of them are going to bring very strong feelings about whether having a little lump on one side of the head is okay, um, and other people may not care about that at all. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the normal growth issues we can encounter in children's heads. We'll talk about micro and macrocephaly. Um, I particularly want to distinguish between positional plagiocephaly and craniosynostosis, and then recognize uh, some other things that you may, want, may not understand or may want to refer just to be sure. So we'll talk about... Um, big and small heads first. Um, when we measure heads, we try to measure the broadest area um, in, across the forehead uh, to the most prominent area across the back of the head. Uh, I think that really just being consistent with your own measurements is going to be the, the, the most important thing to do uh, so that it can be a little tricky if you have other people checking patients into your clinic and you have a different person measuring heads every day. Uh, you want to get in the habit of measuring them yourself if you really are going to uh, know if the, that child's head is growing appropriately. Uh, we use centimeters. You can measure three times and then take an average, and that way if the kid's squirming around and it slips, you can be sure that you get an accurate measurement. So there are a couple different kinds of head charts. Yeah. So there are a couple different kinds of head charts. This is the Nellhaus head chart, and then this is one of the more uh, recent uh, NHANES head charts. And you, these are actually the same measurements, 
plotted on these two head charts. And so um, now that we all have different EHRs, um, the EHR measurement from one pediatrician's office may be uh, a different set of data than was used for the head chart at another pediatrician's office. And so we're seeing a lot more variability. Um, and so just be aware that different populations were used to create different head charts. And so what may seem kind of concerning on, in one view uh, may actually still be within the normal range on another. So you, it, just the size of the head is rarely going to be the reason for concern. So um, when uh, approaching one of these children and deciding uh, what path to go down, um, the things that we want to make sure we catch are signs of increased intracranial pressure. So do we have a bulging fontanelle? Do we have uh, sun-setting eyes? Um, is that head curved really just a straight line going up as opposed to a curve? Um, we don't usually uh, request imaging uh, for a purely head shape issue, uh, whereas for a size issue, we will sometimes recommend a one-bang MRI. And so we really don't use plain films anymore. I found there's so much variability in terms of reading that even looking for suture closure, those tend to be fairly inaccurate. Uh, we are happy to evaluate the children and decide if a CT is needed, and we'll frequently get one for surgical planning anyway. Um, MRI is more useful for looking at fluid. <coughs> MRI does not tell us a lot about sutures and head shape issues. Um, if we're looking about at developmental issues, then MRI under anesthesia, a full MRI is what we would use. So these are the things that we're going to be looking at. What's the status of the fontanelle? What's the size and, and shape of the head? And these are the things that can be going on inside the head. So this is sort of a quote unquote normal brain where we see relatively small ventricles with good brain tissue. This is a situation of microcephaly, whereas if you think about what this MRI read is going to look like, it's actually going to say ventriculomegaly, but clearly this is a lack of brain problem because ventricles are big and the head is tiny. That's because the brain isn't growing. That's not a cranial constriction problem. That's not a hydrocephalus problem. Then you have a kind of a picture like this, which is also a small head. So this is a microcephaly. Here we don't have a lack of brain problem. This is going to be more of a familial type of microcephaly. And then you have a problem like this where you have a lot of brain, and this is a megalencephaly. This is going to be more of like a genetic problem. So what's the anterior fontanelle going to do? One of the referrals that um, I'm still trying to figure out just what to do with is the early closure of the anterior fontanelle, which is really just never in itself a, a reason for concern. The fontanelle can be really any size. They, they can sometimes close as earlier as three or four months, sometimes not be more than just a palpable little divot. Um, as long as the head is growing and the shape is normal, we don't worry about that. The fontanelle can be quite large. Uh, usually they close around 18 months of age, but sometimes they'll last a little longer. But again, how's the child doing? Are they growing fine? Is their head tracking along a curve that sort of parallels normal curves? Um, then we're not going to worry. Uh, it's really the quality. Um, is it nice and flat uh, when they're upright or is it bulging? Uh, those are the things that are going to be much more uh, worthwhile than the actual size of the fontanelle. If it is off to the side, then that can be a sign of craniosynostosis, but it's much more likely that there's going to be something else about the head that's much more noticeable than just a small fontanelle. So microcephaly is a neurodevelopmental problem. Um, and there is technically a definition requiring it to be two standard deviations below the mean. Um, there are some things, congenital type syndromes or chromosomal uh, issues, as well as postnatal problems that can lead to microcephaly. Um, it really is not uh, from craniosynostosis. You can get small heads, but they will not be truly microcephalic from craniosynostosis. Um, and you know, so here you see some infants who clearly have very small heads, um, and they really need to be evaluated for their developmental progress. They don't need a surgery. We're not going to make their heads bigger just to do that. So we want to measure mom and dad's heads. I think that's one of my other favorite things to do, because parents will usually have a very fixed idea of who has the big or the small head in the family. And it's kind of fun when they're wrong, and it's the other one. Um, then also compare the head size to the height and weight. If they're all big, that's fine. If they're all small, that's fine. It's when there's a discrepancy that we worry about. And then it's a lot of these things are things you want to follow over time. Maybe they just haven't had a growth spurt recently, and maybe at their next visit they'll be fine. Um, so again, if it's out of proportion, uh, then, uh, and there are concerns about development, then a referral to neurology is really what's warranted. That's not going to be a surgical problem. 
So then on the other side of the coin, there's macrocephaly. Uh, again, this is when the head is abnormally large. Again, there are some syndromic and congenital causes of this. That, those will tend to go along with the entire child being large or maybe half of the child being large. There are some interesting things that can lead to macrocephaly. And then obviously there are the things that, that we want to catch. So there's hydrocephalus. Um, there's some, some sort of cyst or tumor or something that's causing the skull to grow unnecessarily. And then I'd say the most common is familial macrocephaly. So here you see some kids with a variety of different problems. This one's probably going to be something hydrocephalic or something that needs intervention. Uh, whereas these two down here, that's probably just going to be more of a familial uh, cause. Um, so again, measure moms and dads' heads. And sometimes when you look at the parents, they look fine. You really can't tell. And then you go to measure their head, and dad will have like a 56-centimeter head. And, and you go, well, uh, this is fairly obvious now. But if it's proportionate on the parent's body, you may not notice it. And so I can see where the pediatricians may not notice it as well. Again, look at development, follow over time. You can always check a one-bang MRI. So this is a situation where the one-bang MRI, I think, is helpful because it's going to rule out hydrocephalus or benign extraaxial collections, which are kind of... Uh, the, the two things that we see more commonly. Again, if, the, if they have a large fontanelle that's full or bulging when the child is calm, so not when they're screaming, but when they're calm, that fontanelle is still full or bulging, then that's somebody that I would consider moving towards an MRI on. Um, and then, so these are the two, two choices. There's neurosurgery versus neurology. So we get the macrocephaly where we're concerned that there could be something that might need intervention, whereas neurology would be more for uh, developmental delay or the microcephaly. So now we're going to move into more of a plagiocephaly um, differential. Um, so things that are p positional are preventable. These are issues where the family really needs to have a little bit more of an aggressive uh, approach um, and do more at home, as opposed to synostosis, which is just how the baby's bones are, and that's going to require surgery. So we'll look at plagiocephaly first. Um, some of the risk factors um, are supine sleeping, torticollis. A lot of infants will be born with a preference for turning their head one way or another. And if the family doesn't overcome that preference, then they'll start getting flat there. And then it's sort of like a perpetual cycle where they get flatter and they turn their head more. And um, someone really needs to intervene and stop that cycle. Um, and then we'll come talk about some other things that are risk factors. So uh, the Back to Sleep campaign has been great for SIDS, but it has not been particularly good for plagiocephaly. Um, you can see that the incidence has um, uh, increased significantly uh, ever since the Back to Sleep campaign was initiated. Um, there does tend to be uh, more of a male to female ratio, and I find it really interesting there's a higher right to left ratio, which I think is most likely because most people are, end up being right-handed, uh, but just so interesting that you would see that so early in life. Um, plagiocephaly tends to peak between 6 and 16 weeks, and then it drops off once they're able to hold their head and they start rolling and they position themselves. Um, and many children, I know my first child developed plagiocephaly on one side, sort of in that 6 to 8 week range. It really just requires intervention from the parent to start turning them. So it's a clinical diagnosis uh, for the most part. They get a classic parallelogram shape of the head. We'll see some more pictures of that in a minute. Uh, the best way is if you're looking down from the top. So here you can see um, that this ear appears to be further back just because this ear has been pushed forward with time. Um, and so you can see uh, where torticollis or any turning of the neck or even being put in the crib the same direction every time, anything that influences the baby to turn in the same direction is going to work on flattening that one spot. And so we have to counteract those forces. So here's another diagram of that parallelogram shift. You see that the ear moves forward on the flat side and the forehead moves forward on the flat side. And this is just sort of a, a time lapse, if you will, <laughs> um, looking at how the head starts round, but then the baby starts getting that preference for leaning over there. And then you can see gravity just sort of pulls that head down so that it gets flatter on that side, and that's what causes the ear to move forward. And so I kind of think of it as the, the, my F rule. If the ear is forward on the flat side, then you're fine. Um, I know that everybody's afraid of missing the unilateral synostoses, and so we'll have some pictures in a minute where we'll look at those, and you can see that if the suture back here is closed, then the ear is not going to move forward. The ear is actually going to move back because the other side's growing. But we'll get back to that. 
Um, so torticollis is kind of a chicken and egg problem. You really have to treat both of them. You have to do the neck stretching uh, so that you're improving the torticollis, and that will also improve the flattening at the same time. Um, this is a, a, a group that looked at uh, 80 patients over nine years, um, and they found that some of them wore helmets. Um, however, uh, the children who had left-sided plagiocephaly had higher special education requirements. And again, this just goes into being so fascinating that right-sided plagiocephaly is so much more um, common, but the left-sided ones had um, developmental problems. And I don't know that we have an explanation for why that is, but I just found it really fascinating. So uh, we'll talk about helmets a little bit more later. I see the helmet as really a treatment for the parent. Uh, so you have a child who's coming to you with a really flat head. It got that way somehow, and unless that parent is really going to jump in and intervene to start doing things totally differently in that child's life, that flat head's probably not going to get any better. So I see the helmet as the, that intervention for the parent, that uh, this is now going to hold the full sides where they are and encourage all the new growth uh, in the flat side. Um, overall, that is long term, I think that the relative benefit of helmets is relatively small, uh, but that's if you're comparing um, a, a cooperative helmet wearer to a cooperative parent. Whereas if, you're, if your family isn't making the interventions they need to make, then sure, I think the helmets are going to give you a better result. These are just some fun things that are out there if you Google plagiocephaly treatment. Um, there's this little pillow which is supposed to sort of provide a, a space for the flat part of the head, or if the round part of the head falls in there, then that supports it. Um, and there's a group, I think out of the Netherlands, that looked at this, and they really didn't find any significant difference. Uh, but there was a trend that the families who did both neck stretching and pillow had a little bit more benefit than just the stretching, but it was not significant. I thought this was really cute. Um, who doesn't love cute baby hats? Uh, so this is a tight-fitting hat that has this little bar or thick part that is supposed to prevent the child from turning onto that side. And it's got such a great name, right? And it's probably like 12 bucks or something on Amazon. <coughs> anyway, I have no experience with those things. They're just kind of fun. So now we're moving on to other causes of plagiocephaly. Uh, this is a set of twins. Um, and you can tell that this one clearly had her head up against something in utero so that she started to develop this uh, asymmetry. But it is indeed just a plagiocephaly. Her, on palpating her head, her sutures are all open. Um, and so that's something that, given time, uh, will slowly improve. Uh, here's uh, a kid with torticollis. We've already talked about this a little bit, but you can definitely see how that tilting of the head is going to uh, give him a flat spot. Again, and the, the treatment for this is really physical therapy. Whether that's done by the parent or uh, a, a certified physical therapist, they just need to start turning their head more. Um, here's another case of multiples where you can see uh, twins who clearly have very different head shapes just based upon where their heads were in utero. Um, and then there's the swing phenomenon. So this is a child who uh, actually was in an infant carrier for many, many hours a day. And um, you can see they just get very tall on top and very flat in the back. But this is not a craniosynostosis. This doesn't need any surgery. Um, I think this, at this age, a five-month-old, this is going to respond very nicely to a helmet. And so this is somebody where whatever social situation they're in that they've been in a carrier 18 hours a day is not going to magically change. So I think this is someone I would send for a helmet. So again, prevention is all about education. Um, I'm probably going to skip through some of these slides a little faster, but this information is in there if you're interested in coming back to it. Um, it's just more about like this uh, back to sleep and tummy time. Um, it's always interesting when we see patients back where we've recommended plenty of tummy time and you put the baby on their tummy and they become fussy within five seconds and so you know they're not getting their tummy time. Um, whereas the ones who do do their tummy time, they see improvement, uh, they start getting up and moving faster. Um, so tummy time is very important. Um, we've already talked about the helmets a little bit, but you can see the goal is to hold the, the bulging part stable and then be open. You can see that there's a gap here so that the new growth will occur in the flat spots. Um, some of the places that make helmets like to say that uh, there will be side effects from not having one. Um, to my knowledge, we have not found that that's actually true. Um, Though we do not consider it just a cosmetic condition, there can certainly be 
um, benefits from having a round head. Um, but I always kind of caution families, um, especially when there's a very mild case of plagiocephaly, that I think it's very unlikely those things are going to be a problem. Um, so this is just sort of the def definition of cosmetic versus reconstructive, and that there is support for retaining or um, returning to a normal uh, shape of the body. And AMA policy does also support that. So some of this comes into play when we're trying to get insurance coverage for these devices. So we talked a little bit about neck stretching. Um, we often encourage families to do it as many times a day as possible, so usually with diaper changes, uh, things like that, um, and just holding the head each way. Um, uh, it's not painful for the child. They just need to get used to a movement that they probably haven't been doing as much as they should. So uh, my general preference is I don't refer people for a helmet unless they're over four months old. I want them to have good head control, um, pr particularly in the prone position as well. Um, and they're also growing so fast before that age that they're going to go through helmets very quickly. Whereas once you get up into the four, five, six month time frame, they're going to get significant benefit from each helmet um, and that I don't know it's going to slow down their development. Um, Parents who have been doing the repositioning um, and they're still not seeing benefit, I think that's reasonable. Um, if it's somebody where the, the family really uh, feels that they're going to need assistance with that, then I'll refer them for a helmet. Um, so uh, as I said, the key is uh, education and prevention, maximizing tummy time. So now we'll move on to some other skull topics. There's the metopic ridge. So along with early closure of the anterior fontanelle, the metopic ridge is probably the number two thing that gets sent to us. And I can always tell if the child is over eight or nine months old, this is not going to be a surgical problem. Because the ones who are truly trigonocephalic, they present in infancy with a very abnormal head shape. It's not something that the family notices between nine and 12 months that, oh, you know, there's maybe a little bit more of a bump down the forehead. Plus, they tend to have nicely developed foreheads. If your forehead is nice and broad and you have good orbital bones, um, then there's really nothing that we're going to need to do there surgically. This is the only suture that's supposed to close during infancy. Uh, and there was a group that looked at CT scans obtained in trauma patients and found um, that, the, that nearly 50% uh, of infants had a closed metopic suture at six months of age. Um, so it's really only a concern if there's also trigonocephaly. So this is uh, looking down from the top. Here you can see that the eyes actually stick out further than the eyebrows, and so that is trigonocephaly. This is someone uh, that we would recommend a surgical intervention for. It's not just a little bump down the middle of the forehead. Sometimes it's not even visible. Sometimes it's up in the hairline and the family can just feel it. But again, that's not something that we're going to need to address. So these are the questions to ask yourself and ask the family. Is there a nice rounded forehead? Are the, the bones with the eyebrows or orbital rims nicely developed? Is the head normal in size? If, if it's not big and not small? Um, and is the child over six months of age? Because that's unlikely to be an issue. Again, keep in mind that the fontanelle closes on a bell-shaped curve. Um, and so there will be some early ones and some late ones. As long as development is progressing and overall head shape is, is normal, we don't need to see children who have small fontanelles. So now we'll move on to actual surgical issues. Uh, so this is the front of a book called Craniosynostosis, um, and this diagrams where all the head sutures are. Um, and then we can see that the sutures are missing, uh, so, and the characteristic head shapes you get. So this is the sagittal suture, this is one lambdoid, this is one coronal, both coronals, and then the metopic for trigonocephaly. So we'll start talking about each of those a little bit. Um, these are the different kinds of synostosis. And uh, in terms of treatment, uh, we now have some endoscopic or minimally invasive options that are available for sagittal, coronal, and metopic. Um, and those, we tend to do those around three months of age. So we like to meet the children in their first or second months of life so that we can get all the processes in place to proceed with surgery around three months of age. That surgery is followed by a helmet because what we do, and you'll see pictures in a minute, is we basically release whatever suture is closed and then put them in a helmet to encourage normal head shape uh, growth from there. If we meet them over five months of age, we really don't have a minimally invasive option that we like for those, and so we tend to use an open craniotomy. So you see that four months is kind of a gray area. Depends how, like what their um, 
gestation, gestational age was, um, what the bone feels like at the time we meet them. So four months is, there are still options. Uh, but the bottom line is that we like to meet children as young as possible so that we can give them all the options available. So sagittal, again, is the fusion of this uh, suture down the middle of the top of the head. You tend to get the long and narrow sort of football-y shaped head. You can often have frontal bossing where the forehead hangs out over the eyes and a very pointed occiput. Uh, there's usually a palpable midline ridge. Um, some, in some children, that will be more prominent than others. Um, and then there will be temporal pinching. And since we like to meet children as young as possible, I very frequently will meet infants who've been in the NICU, uh, say, and, and done a lot of like side-to-side -side head turning, and they, they grow a, a head that's longer and narrower. But you can feel their sagittal suture and actually feel the bones moving on one side to another. And so there, we can reassure the families that there's clearly not suture closure. Um, and usually just positioning them on their backs more uh, will help with that. Um, here's an infant who underwent an open procedure. Uh, you can see the pre-op here and the post-op here with a nice rounded head shape. Uh, this is the minimally invasive procedure um, where the red lines indicate the cuts on the skin. So we just make two very small incisions and then we reach under and first we take out this strip of bone where the sagittal suture was and then we make these relaxing cuts on the sides. So if you can imagine these bone plates on the sides sort of opening up while in the helmet, that's what's going to get us our nice rounded head shape. Um, so the next suture to look at is coronal synostosis. Um, and so you can, since you have two coronal sutures, it could be either one or both that are fused. Looking down on this infant, you can see this is a unilateral where this eye does not have good coverage because the forehead has not been growing forward on this left side. You tend to get an appearance of um, the forehead being flat or the eyebrow being pulled up on that side. Or sometimes what you notice is that the other side has grown forward and almost overhangs. We'll see some pictures of that in a minute. The nasal root uh, tends to be deviated. Uh, sometimes there will be a palpable ridge, but sometimes there isn't with coronal. Um, I find that this is the one that has the, the least palpable ridge. Um, and then that ear will be displaced as well. Um, uh, top, so I'm, I'm grouping the sutures that are in the front of the head together right now. So the other one is that metopic. We've already talked about this a bit. Again, this is looking down from the top. I think of these children as looking like the front of a Plymouth Prowler. There, there's a very prominent pointy uh, forehead and then the eyes stick out kind of like the wheels. Anyway, um, you could see great uh, temporal narrowing in them. Um, the eyes could be close together um, and then it will make it look like the parietal regions are really bossed or really wide out here, um, which can be both compensatory growth and it can just be sort of a visual distortion effect from the forehead being so narrow. So here's a true metopic, again looking down from the top, you see that the eyes stick out past the forehead. Um, and then this is her after a surgical procedure, we've now got a nice wide forehead and the eyebrows are now nice and nicely covering the eyes. Um, so again, we have endoscopic or minimally invasive options for these children up to about four months of age. After that, so if, that is if we don't meet them until they're four or five months old, then we have to do the, the standard or open approach or frontal orbital advance. And so we'll look at that now. So here are two kids with unilateral coronal. You can see this one has more of that like flattened, pulled back look, whereas this one really has the overhanging uh, forehead look. You see their um, noses deviated. And so those are all things that get followed, particularly by our plastic surgeons over time. Um, and here you can see the CT scan with the closed suture, whereas these other sutures are all open. So this is our procedure. Uh, we take off first uh, the forehead bone, so a, a flap of bone in the front. Um, based on where that abnormal transition starts, that, that tells us how much bone we need to take off for that piece. And then the orbital bandeau, where the, the eyebrow bone comes off as a separate piece. And then uh, those all get reconstructed and put back together. We tend to use a zigzag scar because a linear scar will make a part, whereas a zigzag scar will hide more nicely uh, in the hair. Um, lamboid synostosis is really the most rare. I think we've seen two or three in the, next, in the last 10 years. Um, but this is the one that everybody seems to be afraid of missing just because the babies get a lot of flattening on the back of the head. I find that this is one of the more unusual head shapes because it affects both the mastoid bone as well as the other side of the head. 
Um, and so in this one, uh, I said there would be diagrams later, so here they are. This is the positional plagiocephaly, so the parallelogram shape where the ear moves forward on the affected side. Whereas here, you can see that the ear on the affected side, which is the flat side, is actually a little bit behind the other ear. And then you get this weird bulge here and sometimes this weird bulge in the front. Um, so I find that that head shape is more characteristic and more unusual than just a standard plagiocephaly where it's just flat on one side and the, the foreheads move forward on that side. Then there's the multi-suture or syndromic. Um, these are not children that I'm worried are going to be missed. These are children that are usually identified um, at birth, um, and so they usually come to our care very early. Uh, you can see that they have a variety of different appearances. Um, sometimes there are very severe things like this, um, where you have few sutures all over the place, uh, and then the head, the brain's gonna keep growing, so the brain's gonna grow wherever it can. If you have open scabosal sutures, it's going to grow out the sides. If you have an open fontanelle, it's going to grow out the top. Um, and so these children are going to need a multi-stage repair. This is not, we're not going to have one surgery that's going to fix this problem. A lot of times what we'll do is release wherever the bones are tightest um, in early infancy and give them a, a time for brain growth. Um, and then we just sort of see uh, where that bone grows back and what the most appropriate next approach is. Um, here's a three-month-old female. Um, where you can see there's closure of uh, the bilateral coronal sutures. You can see there's also sort of a, a flattening on the back of the head. Um, and here you can see these lambdoids are already closing as well. And then you see this is that beaten copper appearance um, where you can just sort of imagine the brain um, gyri sort of trying to push through the skull as that brain is trying to grow. So one of the options we have for this is distraction. Um, and on th this one, you can see the initial cut that's made where we basically sort of cut out a cap of bone on the back of the head. And then Dr. Singh puts on these distractors. Um, and they have a little arm that sticks out of the skin. So all of this stuff is under the skin, but then this little arm sticks out. And uh, the family actually turns this each day uh, so that over the course of um, 10 to 15 days or so, we get this opening gap. Um, you can see we've also made some relaxing cuts down here to sort of help the back of the head grow out at the same time the distraction's happening. And then uh, the little arms get taken off and we let them sit and consolidate and they grow bone across. That's one of the really cool things about operating on infants is when you expose their dura, they tend to bo grow bone. Um, and so once they've grown a sufficient amount of bone, then we can take the distractors out and then come back at another time and address their forehead. Uh, so this tends to give us better correction uh, under more control than a standard open procedure where you just take the pieces of bone off, try to arrange them in the best shape you think you can make, and put them back on, and then hope that they have favorable growth. This actually gives us some control. So that's one of the sort of cool new things we're doing. Um, here's an infant um, with Cruzon syndrome um, where you can see some early pictures and then she had both a distraction as well as a frontal orbital advance. You can see that she has a nice round calvarium now um, and when she's older she'll have the mid-face advancement um, to, to bring her nose out but the, she's had a nice result from uh, two different procedures on her skull itself. So um, as Dr. Singh mentioned, I'm part of the varicraniofacial team. Um, and you can see the different disciplines we have listed here. This is sort of a uh, life plan for the first 18 years for children with syndromic craniosynostosis. And you can see we have them plugged in uh, to different specialists at different times throughout their life. So that um, since this is a multidisciplinary problem, it affects multiple organ systems, um, all of those get addressed. And it's been very rewarding to be part of this team. Uh, we meet once a month, um, and we have an opportunity for patients to be evaluated by um, all, that is, everybody who shows up on that particular day, all the different subspecialties, um, and then we meet together and discuss them at the end. So in approaching children with abnormal head shape, I ask you to be descriptive in your notes uh, because just saying the head shape is abnormal really doesn't help in triaging that to know how soon they need to be seen. Whereas if you say the forehead is bulging and the back of the head is bulging and there's a ridge along the top, then it's pretty clear that we're talking about sagittal. Or if you just say the ears move forward on the same side that's flat, then it's probably just plagio. And so since I now have this abnormal head shape clinic, I'm constantly trying to decide which patients go which, which direction because we can get them in uh, very quickly. We just want them seen in the right place. 
Um, we like to meet children as young as possible, uh, though sometimes like week two or three of life, we may say give them a little more time. Um, so maybe in the first or second month of life. Um, and then that way we can set them up for um, all of the options. Uh, we really don't need imaging before referral for head shape abnormalities. Um, we do believe in the craniofacial team approach, as I said. Um, microcephaly is not a surgical problem as long as the head shape is normal. Early closure of the fontanelle is not a surgical problem if the head shape is normal. Um, and as I said, I have my abnormal head shape clinic to evaluate children. And the goal for that clinic was to make sure that we catch any craniosynostoses, uh, just if we can't tell what they are from the referral paperwork. So I think uh, there is a question that you either have or um, have access to, which is which of the following head shape problems is treated surgically? So option A is a metopic ridge with good forehead development. I think we covered that, that as long as the forehead is good, the topic ridge doesn't need anything. Then there's B, which is early closure of the fontanelle. That one's kind of a dead horse now, huh? We know that that's not a surgical problem. There's C, which is sagittal craniosynostosis. That's sounding pretty likely. Or D, classic plagiocephaly with a parallelogram shift. So does anybody want to vote A? No? B? How about C? All right, excellent. So C is your right answer. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. So I've been asked to repeat the questions for the people who can't hear. So I'll... <laughs> no, it's supposed to go into the feed. <laughs> so <coughs> the first part of the question is, just to paraphrase, um, why is everyone under the sun getting referred to DOC specifically for bands? And the second part is, do I know how much they cost? Um, I'll answer the second part first because I think it's easier. It's several thousand dollars if it comes out of pocket. Um, I have twenty thousand dollars. Hmm. I I had. To that point, that, that is why if I see a patient that I really think would benefit from it, I try to use very strong language in my note that you know this is not a cosmetic problem, this is something where the child has not seen benefit, and so I try to get insurance coverage for them. Your, to your other question, I think that's more um, sort of a general problem that we see throughout medicine these days, which is everyone wanting a second opinion and a reassurance. And it just depends on who you get that second opinion from. Because I certainly see a lot of people who have either already been to a helmet company or are planning to go to a helmet company where I tell them, you know, you really don't need that. You, you know, you're already making modifications, you're seeing progress, just keep going. Um, and so I, I don't know what the answer is to that problem. Um, we, we are consumers, and we are all different in the way we consume our health care, and so some people are going to jump on that bandwagon and want all the bells and whistles, which is going to include a multi-thousand dollar helmet. I hear you. <laughs> 
Other questions? Yes. So you'll see some suture patency for many years. You know, up, up until sort of 10 years of age, you can still see where the suture lines were. And so there is slow growth there. Um, it, uh, the sutures, do, sutures don't disappear. They just sort of get stiffer over time. So in craniosynostosis, the suture actually dis disappears. You don't see any place where, the, where growth can occur um, once they're closed. Other questions? Yeah. So the question is, when people are referred to me, what do I find helpful? Um, I, I can't say that photographs are that helpful because they tend to get faxed at some point and then they lose all visibility. <laughs> you know, like the gray and white blur, that doesn't help that much. I think really just the description of what you see. You know, are the eyes symmetric? Are the ears symmetric? Is something bulging somewhere? Um, and then head growth charts. Those are the two most important things. Uh, there's a question over here. I can understand, so the question is, I have trouble trusting my judgment of whether it's just parallelogram or is it something else. Um, I, you know, that's one of those things that, that is so easy when you have experience, you know, since I look at heads all day. Um, when it's not something that you're looking at all the time, I think just try to imagine, you know, is that child always lying on one spot and does that then lead the ear to move in the direction you're seeing? Because if if you're seeing that the head's flat, but that ear isn't the one that's forward, then that's a problem. So I would say just try to imagine the process that would lead to flattening in that spot and see if the ears and the shape match. Either that or you can Google parallelogram head shape and see if it looks good. <laughs> Ah, very good question. So what kind of tips or tricks, what do we tell the parents to try to do this intervention? Um, so obviously the first thing we ask is tummy time. Are they doing any tummy time? Is it more than just five seconds? And you can usually assess that for yourself very quickly by putting the child on their tummy and see how long they stay there. Um, then the second thing is do they always swaddle uh, the child the same way? And like that's what happened with my son is I had these little swaddles that I loved, they were Velcro, but he could always get the same hand out and so he was always lying the same way. And so if they always swaddle so that the, the head and the child can kind of wriggle into the same position, they need to change that up. You know, that's, that's the first thing to do. Second question, do they always put the child in the crib the same way? If the crib is up against the wall and you always put them in with their head to the left, then the child's always going to be looking out that same direction. Whereas can you flip them 180, put them in the other end of the crib, and then they have an incentive to look the other way. Uh, then I guess the final thing is just to put everything in their life on the side that's not flat. So, you know, if they're in a a bouncy seat, put that so that they have to turn their head and look at you over the bumpy side or the side that's not flat. Just give them no incentive to turn their head onto the flat side. Yes? Great. So there is a handout from the Emily Center for torticollis and neck stretches, if anybody's looking for that resource. Yes.
Any other comments? Thank you so much. Have a great day.